everybody. Welcome to St. John on this Easter morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. So he is risen indeed, and I'm asking you to rise if you're able. Let's sing some songs of our Lord. Christ the Lord is risen today. Let's sing. Christ the Lord is risen today. Give God praise this morning. It's okay to dance. It's okay to jump around. It's okay. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. It's the best day in the history of the world ever. Uh, the next song we're going to sing is Death is Arrested. When 
death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no was a ransom made faithfully born. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. friend. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace. displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus rose with a freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. And whilst you're praising God, turn and greet one another in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus. Thank you.
spirit-filled as we celebrate our risen Savior. And again, we are so glad you are here. In church, happy Easter. He is risen. Amen. What a blessing it is to be here together as brothers and sisters in Christ to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. The tomb is empty. The cross is empty. Christ has accomplished what he came to do. And now we wait in anticipation, as we talked about on Thursday, the headdress towel is folded which means Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. As we turn to a time of prayer this morning, I want us to focus in on that. That during this time, we are called to a purpose on this earth, but our life is now in Christ. And we look forward to that uh, time when we are together. Let's keep our families of the week in mind this week. I always joke, I, I don't know how you get to be families of the week on Easter, uh, but uh, special, special opportunity just to pray for these amazing families, uh, to keep them in our thoughts uh, throughout this week and throughout the year. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you and we praise you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came and lived fully human, experiencing what we experience, the highs and the lows, the celebration and the sorrow, the rejoicing and the pain, that he went through the temptation and the struggles that we do so that we have a savior who understands and knows what we go through. God, we thank you that since the foundations of the world, you loved us enough to give us free will, but knowing that we would mess that up, You had a plan in place to restore the relationship, to reconcile us to yourself, to bring life and life to the full, resurrected life. We thank you that that starts when we put our faith in Jesus, that we are washed clean by the Holy Spirit. And it continues on for all eternity as we are reconnected with you. And God, so may we not take light what happened this week. The sacrifices that were made, the pain that was endured, that should have been ours. The death that happened and the resurrection we celebrate today. It's because of this resurrection that we can put aside all fear, all anxiety, and stand in confidence in the hope and the joy and the peace of Christ our Savior. knowing that he's coming back for us. To restore the world. And so God, as we look forward to that second coming, as we anticipate it in our hearts and in our minds, we listen to your words that say, go and make disciples of all nations. God, may we not hold the gospel, the truth of your resurrection for ourselves only. 
but may we be bold, confident, to share the truth of the gospel, the hope of the resurrection, the restoration of relationship between God and humanity with our family, with our friends, our co-workers, our jobs, our schools, our communities, our neighborhoods. In the day and age that we live up to Kentucky, the United States, and the world. When we interact with people, may a light shine in us that is not of us, but is of Christ. The darkness flees. And people come into relationship with you. God, we know and we understand that we do not save. That is not our job, it's not in our power, it never has been and it never will be, but we are saved through the power of Jesus Christ, but you call us as partners to share that truth. We thank you for that honor, that responsibility. May we not take it lightly. That our faith and what we believe calls us into action. May we step every day, wake up each morning with the gospel on our tongue and lived out through our hands and our words and our feet our actions. And so God, this morning we lift up the families of the week to you, praying that uh, peace and that surpasses all understanding would come over each and every one of them, that you would lead and guide them. We lift up our offerings to you. Everything that we are, our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength to you, God, our time, our talents, our treasures, our money. We give it to you. Not to an organization, not to St. John. We give it to you for you to use for your kingdom, for your glory. But God, may we be good stewards of what you've given to us. And so God, we cannot give you enough praise today and in the days to come for the reality that we live in of a Savior who lives, resurrected from the grave, conquering death once and for all. And look forward life everlasting together with you. We pray all of this in the mighty and holy name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. Ask the ushers to come forward as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings.
morning, church. Morning. Buenos dias. What a wonderful day. So we are celebrating the resurrection, and I love the flavor. <laughs> there is a bird that is always dancing here, but today is resting. I don't see the bird. Every morning I see it there dancing every time we worship. So we are now reflecting on these powerful doctrines based on Hebrews 6, 1 to 3. And if you have not been here before, I invite you to go to Facebook and watch um, the sermons from the other Sundays because we are going doctrine by doctrine. And the author of the book of Hebrew, Hebrews, he's teaching us and saying, let's move forward to maturity. And these are the doctrines that we're supposed to embrace and believe. And he stays first, repentance of, from acts that lead to death, faith in God, um, instruction about cleansing rites, baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And most of these doctrines are basic, based on the, on the book of Hebrews and the ancient church, but in many churches, in most of the time, are not taught enough. So we embrace them, believe them, and live out this doctrine. So today we're going to focus on the resurrection of the dead, which is very important. Let's go a little bit um, deeper and understand why we believe this. Because if someone asks you, why do you believe in Jesus? And you say, I believe in Jesus just because I believe in Jesus. That's not enough. <laughs> in the 21st century, we have to actually not only believe, but defend your faith. Give people evidence of what you Belief, And as I said, all the time, some people don't believe in anything, which they believe that after death, anything happens. Nothing happens. Nothing. I don't believe in nothing. There is nothing after death. I believe that. Then your God is the God of nothing. So when you die, nothing will be your God, and you will be embraced by nothing. <laughs> but I believe... In the resurrection, because so far, the only one who came back from the dead is Jesus. Not Buddha, not Muhammad. That's why I believe in Jesus. The guy came back from the dead, so I trust people that have been there. It's like trusting, uh, trusting like when you believe that people are going to die and no one has been there, but then you have a guy that actually was there. Guess what? Common sense. Common sense. So let's go to the doctrine of the resurrection, one of the, the foundation of our faith. And the apostle Paul, he was defending the doctrine of the resurrection, and there was division in the church, and people were challenging the resurrection, which was preventing the preaching of the gospel, because all our faith is based on the resurrection. So here's what Paul begins to write in 1 Corinthians 15. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how come some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. This is the foundation. If there is no resurrection, if only one bone of Jesus is found, it is over. Game over. So, in 2,000 years, still, the tomb is empty. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 5, he begins to lay the foundation and explain why he believed this. That this is not just out of thin air. For what I receive, I pass on to you as of first importance. And listen to this powerful statement. Only a few times the Apostle Paul says, I pass on to you. He says that in 1 Corinthians 11, teaching about the communion, that he received this from the apostles when he went to Jerusalem. He explained that in Galatians 1 and also in the book of Acts. And then he says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 people, brothers and sisters, at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and at last of all, he appeared to me also, 500 
people. That's one of the evidence of the resurrection. I said that before. Like if you have one uh, experience and you have a vision and you see Jesus or you see people that came back from the dead and you are the only one seeing it, most likely you are drunk. <laughs> or maybe you are smoking. But when 500 people see it, there is no such a thing as massive hallucinations. Something is happening. It's a powerful statement that the resurrection is actually a fact that so many people experience it. Matthew 27, 51, 53. This is what the accounts, the biblical accounts, these are the records. At the moment, what moment? The moment of the resurrection. The curtain of the temple was turned in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. Then the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. This happens actually at the moment of the resurrection. These are early documents that we have. Now, the first case, when Paul, he was a theologian, so he was trying to build his case. He first, they say, well, in this argument defending the, resur the, the resurrection, let me state first why it is necessary, why the resurrection is, 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 is necessary. If there is no resurrection, then Christ has not been raised from the dead. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is what? Pointless, and we are still in our sins. In other words, without the resurrection, there is no hope for eternal life. This is a body physical resurrection. This is not a fairy tale or a metaphorical idea. This is a reality. It's going to happen. We're going to experience it. Those who believe in Jesus and in, in, in his power, because he declared already that he is the resurrection. John 5, 28, 29. Do not be amazed, Jesus is teaching, that the song of man, that the song of man is a divine, divine title that Jesus, Jesus is using. So when people say that Jesus never declared himself that he was God, they have another thing coming. He said it many, many, many times. He says, I am the song of man. That's a divine title connected to Daniel chapter 7. And here he's saying, for a time is coming when all who are in their grave will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will raise to life. And those who have done what is evil will, will raise to be condemned. So the resurrection and the doctrine of the resurrection teaches that the resurrection will be for everybody. The difference is that some people will be raised to life to be with Jesus for an eternity and with God. And others will be raised to be condemned for the eternal judgment. And if, if I said before, if you in life, while your body, while your soul is in your body, if you say, I don't want nothing to do with you, I don't want you, God, I don't love you, I don't want to be with you, God is going to honor your request. He's not going to force you into eternity to spend time with him when you didn't want to be with him for 70 years or 80 years or whatever you live. So it's not like God is punishing you. He's actually grounding you what you desire. But for those who believe in Jesus, those who place his faith in Jesus and say, I love you, I love you, I love you, and I want to be with you, God will honor that through Jesus and will not be condemned but raised to eternal life. The second block of this argument that Paul is presenting is the guarantee. This is a guarantee. The resurrection is guaranteed. It's going to happen. Christ's resurrection is a guarantee that we too will be raised from the dead. How many of you believe in the resurrection? Hallelujah. So you will be one day raised from the dead. And Jesus was always challenged also by the Sadducees, another group that didn't believe in the resurrection. And they asked Jesus, do you believe, basically they said, well, if you believe in the resurrection, answer this. There was a woman and she has seven husbands. And the first husband died, the second husband died, and the third husband died. At the end, in the resurrection, who will be her husband? And Jesus says, no one 
She knows better now. <laughs> there is no such a thing as Mary in the resurrection. You will be like angels in heaven. So if you have a wife or a husband, say, honey, when we die, it's over. No more. Then he's saying, Adam, in all humanity experiences physical death, in Adam. So we are all born sinners. And then through Christ, all believers will experience the resurrection. This resurrection will happen when Christ returns again. Yeshua is returning again. Jesus is coming again. It's a fact, and we believe it. We believe it. We believe it. Now, in case someone asks you to give an account of what you believe, and especially in the 21st century when we need to defend our faith, I'm going to give you several evidences that actually the resurrection happens. And I hope you are like this kid. You just have to preach it and raise your voice because that's the only way you can do it and be happy at the house of God. Look at this. If you forget this, take a picture of the screen. So next time someone asks you, you can give an evidence. Why do you believe in the resurrection? Just because? No. I have evidence that the resurrection actually happened. Number one, we have biblical accounts. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have these historical documents that have been tested for years, and they are a, an evidence because they describe the account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And when we understand this, we're going to uh, believe because when you look back, and you have these written documents, you have archaeological documents and discussions, and you have uh, statues, and you have so many things that really, really, really reveal that people came back to death. When you have that, there's no doubt. And people believe this because most of these documents were written 70 or 80, and sometimes even First Corinthians was earlier than that, that Jesus actually came back from the dead and he actually lived. No one in history has so many evidence that that person lived like Jesus. And now, in the 21st century, when I talk to people and I, and I say to them, okay, do you believe, this is a fairy tale, okay, wait a minute, do you believe um, that Alexander the Great actually was alive and he lived? They say, yes. Do you know when Alexander the Great was alive? 323 before Christ. And you believe that? Like, you know it. Right? And then you believe in, how many of you believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States? Well, the guy died in 1799. You believe that? Then you have um, Winston Churchill, and he was fighting the Germans, and he died in 1965. Do you believe that? So he was leading this meeting and challenging everybody, and a woman came and said, I hate you. If I were your wife, I will poison your tea. And he said, and I will drink it if I were your husband. <laughs> he believed in the resurrection. Okay, so we have all these historical documents. Napoleon, 1821, he was alive. And we have, these are 200 years documents. We're talking about the reality and the fact that the biblical account actually is an evidence that people actually existed and something happens. Early Christian testimony, you have Paul saying that 500 people see it. We have the, the apostles. We have so many people testifying, the early church fathers testifying about the resurrection. The empty tomb, that's another big pointer to the resurrection. I've been there and I said before and I'm going to repeat it today. I love when I went to Israel and visited the empty tomb, big line, people from all nations coming, taking pictures. I paid almost $2,000, no, almost 4000 the whole trip, and 1500 on the plane ticket, and went there, took a picture of nothing. <laughs> the tomb is empty. Wow, people travel around the world to see nothing. 
nothing. The tomb is empty. That's the, one of the pointers to the resurrection, post-resurrection appearances. I, I already talked about that. The people saw it after um, the resurrection, the transformation of the disciples. They were from, from just women and fishermen to become bold and give their life for Jesus, saying he is God, he is risen, he is Lord, and they pay a price. No one will die for a lie. Most of people, when they are lying, if they are caught, they really confess really fast. I was lying, I was lying, especially if you're going to kill them. Not these guys. They decide to die, and they did because of that truth. Jesus is risen. Historical impact. The fact that we have 2,000 years, 2024, and here we are celebrating Easter, celebrating the resurrection, 2,000 years after, that's another evidence that the resurrection actually happened. And the other day I saw a pastor in, in YouTube saying, well, they celebrate the resurrection wrong because it's not that day and, and because they do it with the sun and, and that, 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 that. I said, wait a minute, who cares about when happened? I care about that actually happened. So if it happens, that's what matters. It's like we get so confused. People got confused. Jesus was crucified like this or like this or like this he was crucified right we have these discussions that are pointless what importance is that it happened then we have non-christians and archaeological and non-christian evidence sources we have uh, this historian a roman historian his name is tacitus and he wrote about the about christ's crucifixion and the resurrection we have josephus and he also is a historian, a Jewish historian, and he also wrote about it. This is extra biblical accounts of the resurrection, not the Bible. In case someone said, I don't believe in the Bible, that's a fairy tale. Okay, let's go outside of the Bible. Here you are. Tacitus, Josephus. Exper experiential evidence. People have experienced the power of the resurrection. How many of you have been transformed and touched by the power of the Holy Spirit? How many of you, after you meet Jesus, you want to be different, you want to change? So you are also an evidence 2,000 years after, and here you are confessing, believing. If that's, this is not true, we will not be doing this. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus says to her, talking about Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. That's why Paul picked on this and says, where is all death, your power? Where is all death, your esteem? The grave cannot hold you back when you believe in Jesus. We all are going to die. We all are going to die. That's why I said, don't fear death. Fear not to be with Jesus for eternity and with God for eternity. Jesus conquered death. The resurrection of Christ demonstrated his victory over sin and death. And he now reigns as king of kings and lord of lords. In his second coming, he will judge death forever and will be completely abolished. That's why we believe in this. And I hope that when you come to celebrate Easter, you don't come like, this is another Sunday, another year, let's do it again, and because my daddy did it, and my grandpa did it, and my uncle did it. No, this is truth. And I hope that every celebration, you remember what important it is to walk in holiness, to sanctify your soul, sanctify your spirit, sanctify your body, sanctify your mind, and embrace this truth, because God is coming again Jesus is coming again and every time we celebrate we acknowledge that actually it actually happened it's so important Revelation 26 it says blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection the second death has no power over them but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years the second death so people are worried all the time about the first death when your heart stops. But that's not what is important. What is important is the second death, a total separation from God from eternity. That's what the second death is. 
That's why Paul was claiming and saying, where is all death? Your sting. And the sting of death is sin. Is sin. And the power of sin is the law. We are sinners. That's why we die. But we also have the promise in Jesus that we are going to come back to life. So the people that you love, the people that you spend time with, share the gospel with them. If you really love them and you want to see them for eternity, preach the gospel to your children. Preach your, the gospel to your friends. Share this with people. And when you come to church, come expecting that God will speak to you, that God will speak into your heart. Jesus was teaching, and he said, basically, there is four, time, four types of people. There is people that when they hear the message of the kingdom of heaven, and this is the message of the kingdom of, of heaven, that Christ died, that he was buried, and he's coming back. He was crucified, and he's coming back again. And they said, these are gifts. These are the secrets of the kingdom. It's not given to everyone, only to those who believe. And some people, when they hear the message of the kingdom, when they hear the word, they really look at it. They don't understand. And do you know what he says? He said that Satan, the evil one, is snatched away that truth from the hearts. And then he said, there's a second group. And the second group is the group that hears the world. Get excited. Hallelujah. Sayonara. Hallelujah. And then, they said, then, because they have no root, no evidence, no biblical foundation, what happens? The worries of life kill the world. And then there's another group that way they listen, they hear it, but then the troubles of the world, the persecution that comes, the deceitfulness of wealth, pursuing dreams and success, and that shock the world, and they are unfruitful. And then Jesus says, but there are other groups that they see with their eyes, with their eyes, and they hear with their ears, and their heart will turn and believe. Those are the ones that I call good soil. When they hear the message of the kingdom, they believe. And they give fruit a hundred and sixty and thirty times what it was sold. Which one are you this morning? I hope that you are good soil. That you believe this. And my prayer is that God really touch your eyes to see this. Touch your ears to hear this. But most importantly, touch your heart so you not only believe it, but you understand it. And when you do that, then you can start taking action. Contemplate the reality of life after death. It's a fact that we are eternal. It's a fact that you are more than you, than what you see. This flesh, is temporary, but what is inside is bigger and is eternal. That's why even though when you are sleeping, you are still traveling and moving and doing things around in your spirit, in your soul. Live with hope and anticipation of Christ's return. How many of you believe that Christ is coming back again? Hallelujah. So, you know, believe that and live that with anticipation that he's coming back. Expect it, believe it, and share it. Let your life show people that you actually believe that he is coming. I remember when I was little and I used to do, I, used very, I was very disobedient, I'm sorry. But my daddy used to come back home at five. So I knew that. So I was doing, my mom was calling me since noon. Yo, smart, yo, smart, yo, smart. Ah, 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 4.30. Yes, more. Five. My daddy was coming, and I knew it. So by five, I was where? Playing in the park? No way, Jose. I was in the house because I knew that at five, daddy was coming. When you believe something, you act on it. So if you only really believe that Jesus is coming back, let your life show that to people. Live a life that impacts others. It's contagious that you are passionate about this, that you really believe it. Share the hope of the resurrection with others and boldly proclaim the good news of eternal life in Jesus. 
Talk about it. Ask questions. Don't force the gospel to anyone. My job and your job is to share the gospel. Then create a space for the Holy Spirit to work because he's the only one who can convince people. Not you. Don't go like, yeah, because, because, no, 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 no. Just share the gospel. Ask questions and wait. Go away. Pray. And ask the Holy Spirit to turn people's hearts. He's the only one who can do it. I was not there 2,000 years ago, but I know. How do I know? Because the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who is here to testify to us that this is the truth. It's a fact. And we believe it. Let's pray. Lord, help us grasp the significance of the resurrection of the dead. Fill our hearts with the hope that one day we will be raised with you. Strengthen us to live with an eternal perspective and evaluate our choices, our choices and priorities according to the fact that you are coming back again. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. All right, church, we're going to do a song here, and it's a time of reflection. You stay in your seat, stay seated, and come to the altar and pray and spend some time with God. And if you have never given your life to Christ, what better day to give your life to Christ than the day of resurrection? So join us as we sing.
morning in the dead of night You're not leaving I've been to the bottom, I've been to the top I can't run away, your love will never stop With me in the morning in the dead of night You're not leaving I've been to the bottom, I've been to the top I can't run away, your love will never stop We got one more song. Yeah, there's one more song. It's going to be awesome. And, and, and so we have one more song, and, and my voice is fading, so you all have to sing really, really loud. Let's sing. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Those giants are dead now. Sing, this is our God. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, bleed the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God. Will be
Well, I have been here nine months, so I'm about to have a baby. <laughs> this is Resurrection Sunday. Now I have experienced St. John to the fullness, right? So I'm very excited to be here and know the church and get to know people even more. And also, I'm excited that we have this wonderful communion table. And there is a guy who has an engineer mind to create this flooring table. He doesn't want to be named, but Jesus knows who he is. Um, but we want to celebrate, celebrate and acknowledge the hard work. He said, I promise by Easter um, it will be there. And here it is. And then the lantern will come later. But this is powerful just to experience um, that. So thank you for coming and celebrating with us. May the reality of the resurrection of the dead infuse your life with hope and purpose. May you walk confidently knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Christ is coming back again. God bless you and go in peace. Or in pieces, but go. God bless you. This is like God. This is like God.